Good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone's having a really great Memorial Day weekend. Uh, I hope you got the day off. Uh, I'm back with a review for you today. Uh, this is actually a review that was requested uh, a while ago after I showed everyone the books that I got from a library book sale. And uh, two other booktubers, uh, KCRXRD and Frenchie D, both asked me to review well, this actually, and one other book. Uh, the next one's coming up relatively soon. But this one is the Julian Barnes one that they wanted me to do. It's called A History of the World in Ten and a Half Chapters, and it's by Julian Barnes. Um, for whatever reason, uh, I like my fiction to cohere in sort of predictable ways. And oftentimes when that doesn't happen, I uh, leave a reading experience feeling a little less than satisfied. Chalk it up, I guess, to being born and, and weaned uh, on something other than uh, the so-called postmodern novel. But in several ways, this book um, complicates my expectations of what I go to fiction looking for. And it can feel more like a series of short stories. Uh, more than a traditional novel at times, but there's certain kinds of interconnectedness and the ways that the chapters really speak with one another and to one another that really makes this a really enjoyable, really wonderful, really, really wonderful book. Uh, the chapters do span the scope of what um, we like to think of as human history from uh, chapter one is a retelling of uh, the story of Noah's Ark from the perspective of a stowaway woodworm. And uh, there's also a chapter, I think it's chapter three, uh, which is clearly based on the 1985 uh, PLF hijacking of the Achille Loro, which some people might have, um, might actually remember. There's kind of a playful jokiness uh, reminiscent of what I thought Novikov, kind of Novikovian playfulness with ideas and with language, uh, but also this preoccupation with the mythic and how it relates to our everyday lives. That sort of reminded me more of Borges. And both of those things kind of inform the way the chapters, like I said, the way they work together. Um, there's one chapter called The Wars of Religion in which a, bish a bishop sits down on his throne during a service in church and he immediately falls down uh, onto the floor because of a really bad woodworm infestation. Remember, I mentioned woodworm in uh, the Noah's Ark, but these themes see, uh, keep popping up in story after story. So uh, the church files suit for destruction of its of its throne, of course, who do they sue? They sue the woodworm. And even for even for fiction, this sounds a little twee and jokey and cute, but it it works in a really convincing way, and it doesn't come off as really condescending at all. Um, and I think it works so well because these pieces do hang together as something more than just a series of stories. And many of them provide really fascinating things to think about. Uh, there's a chapter called uh, Parenthesis, which might be the half chapter that's referred to in the title, that provides almost an essayistic analysis of love, which, um, even though it sort of um, shifts modes from the storytelling, explicitly storytelling narrative drive of the rest of the novel, it really works and it, it sort of contributes to the novel overall progress. It's told through the voice of a man who is laying next to the woman that he loves, uh, desperately trying to fall asleep, but at the same time finding himself unable to stop thinking and meditating on anything else other than the power and the mystery of human love. It, it sort of, it, it helps shed light on other chapters, but it's also just sort of nicely set aside by itself, and it works very much just on its own. Uh, another entire chapter is dedicated to a fictionalized account of uh, Theodore Jericho's rendering of maybe his most famous painting called The Raft of the Medusa. Uh, 
incorporating real life. And we uh, quickly learn through Barnes's retelling that labels like this are pretty perfunctory. A real life accounts on which the painting is based, Barnes adeptly shows how Jericho selected details carefully, left other details out, and made still other details up in order for the painting to ring true to the viewer. This immediately raises really important questions about history for the reader, and not just history, but really any mode of representation. How is history possible if we only recognize it as a series of retellings of past events, especially true retellings of past events? How do we reconcile truth with the fact that, well, the way he painted his picture was very selective? Uh, is the historian always a writer? Or, to put matters even more explicitly, is she always a novelist? So these are some really interesting questions that he brings up. Another theme that echoes throughout the novel is that of religion and its mystifying effects on the human mind. I think if you read this book without care, this can seem many chapters in it can seem like a harsh treatment of religion and the religious mindset. Noah, in the first chapter, which I referred to earlier, is identified by the stowaway woodworm as a vicious drunk. The Catholic officials, who I also, re also referred to, uh, try the woodworm for eating the bishop's throne. They come off as more than a little maniacal. And the last chapter coyly pokes fun at some common ideas that we have about heaven. There's one other chapter called Project Ararat, uh, which takes up the story of a former astronaut who's had a religious conversion and now has put his and his wife's lives on hold to find the historical Noah's Ark on Mount Ararat in Turkey. Um, and even though he comes from this religion, this small small town America, religious, conservative slash fundamentalist background, um, even the locals have their reservations as to what he's going to find there. And the chapter ends with him having raised enough money to go on his mission, to find everything he needs to find. And he finds the Ark and he collects his samples and he comes back home to have them radiologically tested. And the test shows that there may be no more than a couple of hundred years old. But this doesn't matter. He's already planning his next mission the year after, and he's even more determined to find Noah's remains. And I think when I got to the end of that chapter, I thought to myself, it's not really God that works in mysterious ways. It's the human mind. And I think that might be part of Barnes's point with that chapter and with the novel uh, more generally. Rarely do I find works of fiction so self-referential, and I use that sort of word that I have a little bit of unease about earlier, postmodern. Uh, rarely do I find them so, so entertaining and so appealing. Uh, Barnes might be telling us about Noah's Ark and about Mount Ararat, but he's telling us about very human, very, very human, all too human forces even though he might be using uh, sort of a register of the superhuman or the metaphysical to do it. Love and the weird preoccupation that perennially, uh, perennially occupy us and ideas, they're all here in the book and not in the heavy-handed way that you might be familiar with, that I'm certainly familiar with, uh, liking these kinds of books. Um, it's really playful. Um, it's serious without taking itself too seriously. And I think those two things in conjunction with one another really gives it a coy sort of charm that's really tough to dislike. I really liked this book, and I'm really glad that uh, Casey and, uh, and um, Frenchie D suggested it so I could pick it up because it was not at the top of my to-be-read list, but they put it there. And I love recommendations, so if anyone else has one, please let me know. A History of the World in Ten and a Half Chapters by Julian Barnes.